everyone and welcome back. In this video we're going to pick up from where we left off previously and we will be implementing some more logic to our AR pawn. Just a quick aside and a quick thank you to all of the Patreon supporters for the generous donations so far. I uh, just wanted to mention this because with the donations that I've received I have upgraded the audio equipment that I'm using so I'm currently switching over to the Rode Podcaster mic. Hopefully this will make the sound a lot more solid and you should get a lot less background noise. So currently in the trial phase of this I think I've got it set up in the best way after testing it a few times so hopefully going forward the sound will be a little bit different but a little bit more crisp. Okay so to begin what we're going to do today is we now have the geometry being tracked for through the AR functionality. We want to expand upon this and when we have this and touch the screen we're going to place something in the world. So the first thing that we know that we need is a placeable actor so we're going to create a new blueprint class of type actor and we'll call this bp underscore place. Now we don't need to open this at the moment or do anything with it this is just going to be so that we have a value to pass into an argument a little bit later. With that done we can go to our bp underscore pawn and inside of here we just want to pick up from where we were which is in the event graph. Uh, we had our debug logic happening down here on the event tick previously. What we can do now is we can actually take this off. We don't need this to be running. I'll just keep this to the bottom of the script in case we do need this a little bit later but really that's just that was just showing us all of the geometry that we had tracked at all time and as we saw that did get a little bit messy so it's not something that we will probably fall back to. So we still need the session to be started on the begin play. And then what we're going to do is when we receive a touch to the screen, we want to find out where the user's pressed, where that relates to in the real world space, and if we have some tracked geometry. So to get this started, we will search for the input touch, which will just come under uh, the search term touch down here. And this will give us the input touch event. And this is very much like any other key binding. You have your pressed, released, uh, but we also have some extra things for the uh, movement. So if you're moving across the screen to detect things like swipes, we have the location that you pressed and also the index if you're tracking more than one finger. We're not going to need any of this. We're just going to be working with the press. And what we want to do is create a new function. So if we had a function and we'll call this world hit test. Now this is in the AR template and I'm going to go through this and not explain everything straight away because I think this is going to be an interesting function just for people to kind of see if they're uh, in a way grokking the, the logic that we're getting and going through. Uh, I think a lot of you are going to work out what this is doing. But I'm also going to go back over this at the end just to double check that everything does make sense. But this is one of those things that when you see why it's set up the way it is, uh, you'll get a much better appreciation of how you can expand upon this logic and what you can do with it. So the first thing we want to do inside of this function is we will pull off of this execution pin and find a line trace for objects. And we need to pass in the standard arguments for this type of thing, which is our start position and the end position. So remember that we've set our own player controller class up, so we're going to get the player controller. And from this, what we want to find is the position that the user's pressed uh, deprojected from the screen world space. So we can do this with the deproject screen to world, which we can see down here. And what this will do is it will take the input that's been found by the player controller, and we can get the start position or the world position, so where we've touched, and that's going to be the start point. We then want to take this and do some equations to this. So we want to get the start point and add a vector to a vector and we want the world direction. So this is going to be from where you've touched on the screen, where we want to cast this into the, the world space uh, in, in the room that you're recording essentially. So we're going to find a vector multiplied by a float, which is going to be our distance. So we can give this a number of something like a thousand for the distance forward that we want this to trace. And we're going to plug this in to the second argument down here. So we're taking the world position and the direction, adding those together, times the the actual distance that this is going to go into the world and that's going to be our end point so where you've touched on the screen into the world is the end point so that's really the direction that we're tracing so nice and simple there and then what we want to do is also add a bunch of object types so we're going to pull off of this and make this into an array and we want several pins here and basically we want one pin for every different type of collision that we have so we'll add these in we'll get the world static world dynamic the pawn the physics body the vehicle and we're also going to add in the destructible. And this is the bit I just want you to see if you can uh, work out why it is that we're doing these traces, because what we're going to do from here is whether we have hit one of these or not, we're going to return this value. So we'll take a return node for the function. We'll pass in the return value, which is our Boolean. And we're also going to plug in our out hit result. 
So I probably should have done that the other way. So I'm just going to move those around so that's a bit tidier. And just try and work out why it is we're checking if we have or haven't hit one of these types of colliders. With that done though, we can go back to the event graph. And what we want to do is we're going to pull this straight in and plug that into the pressed state of the input touch. And we want to get the player controller again down here because we also want to do another check for something very similar, but this is going to be the uh, the input touch state. So we're going to pull off of here and get input touch state. We're going to only worry about the single one touch state at this point in time, so this isn't going to count for things like putting both fingers on the screen and then pulling them apart to zoom and things like that. This is just going to be if a single finger touches the screen, then that's what we're looking for to spawn an object. We want to pull off of the location X. I'm going to make this into a vector 2D. And then we'll just plug the Y into the Y value as well. Now with that done, this is our screen space that we have. So we have the X, Y coordinates of the screen and where the user has touched within that, uh, which reminds me, we also want to click on the world hit test again. And in fact, we can do this an easier way. We'll go into the world hit test and we have our screen position, which we haven't filled in yet. So the deproject screen to world also needs another argument. And we're just going to plug that straight into the function. This will fill this in for us automatically and name it for us as well. So a nice quick way to add arguments into function calls. So back in the event graph, we can now plug in the result of the screen position into the screen position argument in the function. And what we're going to do here is taking the return value of if on whether or not we've hit something inside of this function, we will do a branch check. And this is probably all coming together now, making sense to a lot of you why we're doing this because what we're going to do off of this is if we haven't hit something, so if we haven't hit something that we're checking for within this function, then we're going to come down here and we will spawn our actor. Before we do that though, uh, we want to do a line trace against the tracked objects. So line trace, tracked objects, and we'll see that this falls underneath the augmented reality functionality. So again, this is uh, coming included on behalf of the AR plugin that we've set up. And we can turn off the top two here. So we don't need the uh, feature points or the ground planes. We're just going to test for the extents and the boundary polygons. The location is again going to be from the vector that we made just a moment ago. And this is going to turn an, this will return an array of AR trace results. So we will, from this, we'll get the length of the array and we're going to do a compare int. We just want to find the, the value of the length. Uh, we want to compare that with the zero. And this is really just a short kind of branched check rather than doing a branch, whether or not something is smaller than, more than, or equal to. This does all of that for us in one go. And we're going to say if the length of this array is more than zero, so we have a value in there, then we know that we have some tracked geometry. If that's true, then from here, we can spawn the actor from class. And now this is why we needed that argument earlier. So we now have our object, which is going to be our placeable object. So the BP underscore placeable. And then we just need to fill in the transform. So to do this, we can pull off again from the array. We'll get the first element of the array. So we'll just leave that as zero. And we'll get the local to world transform of the element. So this is something specific in here. So we're going to get local to world transform. Again, another AR function, and we can plug that into our spawn actor. So we're going to find out the piece of geometry that we're tracking, the, the one that we know exists for sure, that we have in the array that we've just touched, and we are going to place the object at that point. So that means, like I said, rather than having uh, multiple branches or different checks, this is always going to work if we've got more than nothing in the array, which means we've got a valid object tracked. Otherwise, we don't need to worry about these. And you can add some functionality off of those if you wanted to, but uh, for what we're going to be testing, this is going to be perfectly fine. And basically, that is everything set up ready to go. We just need to fill out the placeable actor with just an object to represent it in the world. But just to come back here very quickly, so now I think we know what we're doing is we're checking whether we have an object that we've poked on the screen which has a collider type of one of these. Now, pretty much everything that we place in the world, whether that be some scenery, the placeable actor we're about to put in, is going to have one of these collision types. So for instance, the placeable actor will probably be left as world static. So what this is doing is we're checking that we haven't hit something that we've placed in the world. So we don't want to be able to stack actors on top of each other. Uh, if you do, this is why I said this is going to be quite useful just to understand. If you did want the ability to place things on top of each other, then you're going to want to change this up a little bit because this is purposely looking for other objects in the world and it will stop you from stacking things. 
So then once we've confirmed that we haven't touched an actor that we've spawned, which means that we have touched a valid bit or at least a bit of uh, potential geometry, then we're going to go down. We're doing our check down here to see if we've actually hit some AR geometry. So something in the world, real world space, whether that's a desk or a floor. And if that is the case here, we're checking that that actually has been tracked, then in which case we're going to spawn our object. And I'm just going to change this, in fact, to always spawn ignore collision just to be safe. So we're going to compile that hit save and that is the AR pawn ready. So we're just going to go into the place black to do something nice and simple here. We can bring in a scene root component and we will remove that one just so we get rid of the, the spherical display there. And then on top of this, we can spawn in a cube, add a component cube. Now, the reason I've added the scene is because the cube's going to be a little bit big. If we remember that the standard cube that I think we're given, the one by one equates to 100 centimeters or uh, one meter by one meter. So uh, this is going to be real world scale as well. So this is going to be quite big to place on the desk if we're going to be tracking things like desks or even in the center of a, of my room in the floor. So I'm going to take this down to something like 0.2. So this will be about 20 centimeters and we'll do that on all axes. So this is going to be a little bit smaller just so that we can see it on a smaller surface. So if we compile that, that's pretty much everything ready to go and we can hit save there. Now, before I do what I did previously, I'm going to build this out. So we're going to take the same approach to building the Android project. I'll put this on my phone and I'll show a quick demonstration that everything is working and what you should be expecting. Before I do that, though, just want to go over something which I find quite interesting from the AR template. Uh, and this is something that I'd probably re recommend you guys look at outside of the video and try and implement yourself. I really like this kind of effect that they've added. Uh, and that is basically that when they spawn the object into the world, they do a small animation. So you've got an intro animation. And this is just a simple timeline. You can see it's got the full track, which is starting the object several units, uh, 50 units above where the object is spawned in. And then it's slowly lerping that down to the floor ground. And at the same time, it's also doing some scaling animation. So this is just kind of adding that squash and stretch animation technique to make things feel a little bit more organic and a little bit kind of bouncy and real. It just adds a bit of fun to it as well. I won't go through that because it's not specific to what we're doing. And this is kind of some of the added stuff that I think uh, the new guys can get a bit bogged down in trying to work out what it's doing and if it's actually required. So this 100% isn't required, but it does add a nice interesting effect to the spawning of an object. So I definitely see about adding something like that in, uh, maybe looking at the template and making some variants of that. OK, but with all of that said, we're going to go back to the main window on our project. We'll go to File, Package Project and Android. Set this to the standard ATC option and we'll just let this build out. And again, like I said, I'll put this on the phone, do what I did previously. I'll record that and upload that with the video just to show that everything that we've gone through in this tutorial is definitely working and the kind of thing that you'll be expecting. OK, so we can see in the video that I've recorded on my mobile device that we are definitely tracking things. It's a little bit harder. You can see me kind of working out at the beginning which bits are being tracked. I thought it was going to track the desk and it didn't quite have enough information because of the strange shape of the desk, I think. But in the end, it definitely tracked the floor. And you can see I've placed loads of cubes around the floor and different bits of the, the table that I have beside me as well. So this is why it's going to be worthwhile trying to come up with a way that makes sense for your AR application to display what is being tracked. But again, not to make it overbearing and overload the, the screen with information like we did previously when we're tracking and showing everything. Now, the other thing, of course, is that you can see that the cubes were black for some reason. I think I've just not set the material up to be compatible fully with mobile devices. And again, you might want to do things like adding a drop shadow on the bottom of the objects because you're not going to get real shadow information from the, the lighting and stuff in the scene, at least not easily. So this is, again, something to know. You've, you've got the basic understanding of how to set up an AR application from scratch with no template, no starter content or anything. So now might be a good time to go and have a look at the AR template, see how they've added the drop shadows and the materials that they've used for the objects and things like that. And some of the nice added extra effects in there. But this has definitely covered all of the important things that you need to know and hopefully what they're doing to get a basic AR application up and running. So in the next video, what I wanted to do is start taking a look at some of the things like image tracking and maybe even 3D tracking. I'm not sure if that's completely possible inside of the AR core or AR kit applications yet. Uh, it's something I worked with, I think it was Vuforia inside of Unity a little while ago. And uh, 3D model tracking is really, really cool and really, really useful for using as a marker. Uh, if there's not built in support for that, I might look at uh, some way of tricking it into also recognizing some kind of 3D objects as an image tracker. But we're definitely going to do image tracking next time.
So I'll leave that video here for now. As always, if you've enjoyed the video or find this useful, then please do leave a like and share the video around. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button to be kept up to date with all of the content coming from any of the playlists on the channel. And as ever, thanks for watching, and I will see you all next time.